Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I, I am so glad to be uh, at the, 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 the Fourier February talks, uh, FFT meeting. I uh, had, I mean, uh, I, I have been coming, wanting to come for a while and it, it, for a few years it just didn't work out, but it has worked this year. Unfortunately, I am also uh, right now uh, having a lot of, of administrative responsibilities uh, and I, I'm, I'm in a period of my life where I have less time to do original work. So uh, I, I'm going to give you a, uh, I think for everything that I could talk about, somebody here has heard it already. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to, uh, I haven't, uh, you have no title yet because I have no title yet. Uh, you're going to have, you're going to decide what it's going to be. So I'm going to, I have three possibilities for you. And the first one is uh, uh, work on empirical mode decompositions. Gaurav Thakur talked a little bit about them uh, this morning, but not everybody heard that. And uh, what it is, uh, is, is trying to decompose uh, functions of which you know that they're given by uh, 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 a combination of components that are oscillating, but with uh, changing frequencies and changing uh, uh, amplitudes. And recently we have started working on uh, uh, the situation where we know that the shape function is not just a cosine. So that's the first topic. The second topic is uh, in the last few years I have been working on uh, with art historians on uh, and uh, I did work on developing mathematical tools for art history and uh, actually last fall I organized a series of four lectures at Duke which we called the Art Plus lecture series where mathematics and art meet and uh, uh, so I could give I, 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 I would plan it was uh, the, the second talk is about uh, three topics out of that lecture series one of which in what uh, which I was involved and then the third is distances between bones uh, which is work that I have been involved with with biologists but that uses tools from computational differential geometry in order to find good distances uh, between surfaces that we then use for biological applications and I, I, I I talked about that, but we have some more uh, work uh, uh, at, at Pete Casasa's birthday conference. But uh, so, who wants topic one? <laughs> 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 topic two. <Yay>. <laughs> topic three. <laughs> um, two again. Yay. I think the twos have it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here we go for topic two. People who want to hear about the other topics can ask me offline sometime. <laughs> okay, so um, let me. So in this talk, I will talk about uh, uh, three different. Uh, 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 three different. How do I do this? Uh, view. Uh, view what? Where's full screen? I want slideshow. I want slideshow. Very good. Thank you. There it is. Okay, so I will talk about three topics. Uh, the first one is by uh, uh, something that Massimo Fornasier did. He was a postdoc of mine in, in uh, Princeton uh, a few years ago. He's now uh, a big shot professor in Munich. Uh, and this was work actually he did even before he was a postdoc, so as a graduate student, and it's, it's really incredible. So uh, what happened is that there's a very famous church in Padua, the Eremitani church, which, has, uh, which was bombed near the end of the Second World War by mistake, and uh, it had world famous, uh, renowned frescoes by many people, but I mean the most famous one were by Andrea Mantegna, and after the, the bombing the church was just in rubble. I mean, uh, they, uh, uh, it was a, a big tragedy for the city and, and, and art historians went and, and uh, got all the little fragments of, of plaster and so on and uh, kept them in boxes, tried to sort them, but it was of course an, an impossible. And they, in the 90s, they said uh, uh, they had them all scanned uh, very carefully. Oops, what's this? Oh no, that was a figure. Oh, okay, sure. So there were fragments here. So uh, you have, uh, they were, they were uh, collected and they were uh, 
I think over 60,000 fragments. Together they made up uh, only a few percent of the whole area. Uh, they, uh, they were really tiny. I mean, here they, I mean, so most, some fragments actually you could do nothing with. Here's a fragment where you see something, but some fragments were just one color. I mean, well, where did that come from? But so uh, uh, these fragments typically were between a couple, uh, two to five centimeters square, so really tiny. And uh, this is what they had. They had them scanned front and back. They were numbered uh, and those data were made available to the public. So. Uh, now, what they had also was uh, uh, old black and white photographs from before the World War, which were pretty good resolution, <coughs> and they had uh, changed them, for, uh, uh, adapted them for parallax, and they had made real life-size uh, reproductions from them. But I mean, uh, for <laughs> you imagine this is a puzzle. I mean, uh, this is in a big church, the frescoes on the wall, so one of these things is, is this big, I mean, half the, the podium here at the front, and you have little puzzle pieces like that. You know that you only have 1% of the puzzle pieces, and <coughs> not only do you know that it has to, you don't know which fragment, which fresco it belongs to, but you also don't know the orientation. So, uh, uh, and, uh, so, what had to be done was to try to find where to put these and uh, they also wanted to, to, I mean, they realized they had to do this in a, well, they, they could have a, a project of a few years, but I mean, it had to be done within that time. So, um, and uh, what, what uh, 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 Massimo pr uh, proposed was to use mathematics to, uh, to attack this. It had nothing to do with the aesthetics, of course. It had to do with trying to do the, 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 the puzzle of it. So um, what they did was they uh, digitized the uh, black and white uh, high resolution photograph and they uh, uh, digitized also uh, the, uh, uh, all the fragments. And uh, to do that they had to look also at all the rotations and in order to be invariant for the rotations of course I mean look this is a harmonic anal analysis group what do they do they look at the representations of the rotation groups so they looked at uh, uh, the, the, the circular harmonics and they decomposed so whenever they had a fragment they would take a little circle on that had uh, content they would decompose that in harmonics and then they could very easily compute digitally what that would look like if it were rotated on a different grid and so they did all that and then they found uh, uh, from, from the representation in, in harmonics they found how it would have looked like in rotation they found where they had the best match on the, on, on, on the fresco and they uh, uh, and this was all doable very fast I mean they first did it for all the fragments but then the checking now they were uh, uh, um, they actually did this very carefully. I mean, uh, uh, what what they? I mean, in most cases, it was clear when they checked among different possibilities that there was one peak. But in many cases, it was not so clear. And even if it was clear, like in this case, which is a synthetic case, it is clear that you have a copy there, and that's the sharp peak. There are also other peaks that are quite large, but not as sharp. And so what they did is they, they turned this into a big project that uh, brought the people of and volunteers from Padua art students but also anybody who had time to come to work on this so they would they would uh, they would run the, the thing and it would give them possible matches and people would then decide on this among these possibilities is the one that is and in some cases in about one percent of the cases it was necessary to have a person really look at it but it really reassured art historians no end that this was not all decided by machine and uh, and so and it, it made for actually made it a big community project people would come in and volunteer I mean and 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 and, and work with the software and uh, uh, there were a whole lot of, of people who contributed uh, uh, it also gave a lot of, of, of uh, I mean there was a kind of sociological thing to it it gave a lot of of, of uh, uh, PR to the whole project 
the fact that volunteers were asked and would come in and would tell their, their all their cousins and so on. And uh, as a result of that, there were people who, who said, you know, uh, when the bombing happened, my grandfather saved one of these pieces and it's become a heirloom in my family, but here, you can have it. And so, actually, they, they gathered more pieces that had been kept and, and stabilized them and scanned them and so on. So, um, so for a few years, with many, many, many volunteers and so on, uh, these, these pieces were then sorted. And uh, uh, they would come in and, and sit in a lab in, in, in the, the, the main office, uh, uh, helping out. And uh, they uh, see 80,000 fragments and uh, only 77 square meters of the original 10 times as many square meters were actually uh, usable. And uh, there was a visual analysis by a human operator, and here you can't see the table, of course, but what happens is that uh, uh, one thing gives the largest number, but other large numbers would be also uh, 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 singled out, and they would actually pick, and uh, neighboring things would also be shown already. And uh, so that way, all the different fragments, all these 70,000 fragments, were uh, uh, found on, on, on the here. Actually, you see the, the, the other possible picks for this. this the actually, these three fragments were together, and then somebody would say no it's clearly the hair of this saint and not the column and uh, uh, yeah the 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 the, the, sec the the searching was all done in black and white because the original figure i mean the, the photograph was in black and white okay so after all was done this for instance for one of the fragment of, of frescoes is what they had so you can see how little there is of the full area but all that was found and identified and so on by circular harmonics. So if ever you have students who tell you in, in an undergrad course that circular harmonics are not useful, you can... Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, and now the next thing, I mean, art historians were really, really happy with this because they said, look, what we can do now is we can propagate color from this. We now have what it looks like and we can then see what the color is and propagate it. And they have techniques for doing that, for thing when things are very, very damaged. But then uh, uh, Massimo said, but you know, we probably can do that mathematically as well. And uh, so here is a, a, a way in which uh, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, is done. Here is an original image. Then if you have just this information, you can propagate it mathematically to here, or even if it's much less more scattered, you can propagate it to that. The way you do this, and so the similar thing was done for, he showed how they could do that for this particular uh, image. Now, the, uh, the way this, this is done is uh, uh, with methods that you very well know. I mean, on the one hand, you have a representation that you know is going to be sparse in wavelengths. On the other hand, you have a representation of a piece of it that is uh, also sparse in wavelets where you have color. And so you can then, by saying that you want to, uh, uh, to have a, 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 a three-dimensional, namely this color representation that coincides here and that will in gray value coincide with the one you have there, find what will be the best representation given that you have this sparse information on color in the three color images. And it's, it's a, a, a very nice application of, of, of sparse expansions and sparse uh, extrapolation. And, uh, and what it does is, again, uh, he, he, he positioned this very carefully. He didn't say mathematics will do this for you. What happens is that this was a guide for the art historians to then do the colorization. And, and in fact, that's how they work. When they have color information, they propagate it a little bit, and then they look at it, and then they start filling in. So he was giving them that first guide, which saved an enormous amount of time. And so now if you go to Padua, there is a beautiful exhibit in the church where some pieces have been completely colorized, otherwise others have been partly colorized, in others they just show the fragments and, and so on, and there's very nice explanation. And for this work uh, Massimo got uh, a prize of ICIM and a lot of, of, of visibility, and it was really beautiful. So that was the first thing that I wanted to showcase in art and math and where they meet. Let me now show you a second. Uh, uh, okay, so this is work uh, in which I was uh, involved myself 
together with oh come on uh, full screen mode um, together with uh, students uh, uh, graduate students and an undergraduate student as well at uh, when I was still at Princeton this is this painting is a painting by uh, Vincent van Gogh it's uh, and that's how you should pronounce it by the way van Gogh uh, uh, but if you say Van Gogh, I will I will listen to. Uh, uh, so this is a, a, a painting. It's a, a study that he made of uh, uh, blades of grass, a little patch of grass, uh, while he was in Paris. It had been known for a long time that there was another painting underneath, and this is an, an X-ray. You see, you see all the nails of where the canvas has been nailed on, on and you see the, vaguely that there is a, a portrait of a woman underneath. In fact, about 25% of uh, paintings by Vincent van Gogh have uh, another painting underneath because he was poor and uh, he would make studies and then he would reuse that canvas and what he would then do is apply a new layer of lead white, of primer, and then paint over it again. And so there are these paintings underneath. But uh, Art historians were particularly interested in this painting, uh, even though there are many uh, uh, portraits that are known from him. This is a portrait of a peasant in uh, the period where he lived with his parents in Nunen before going to Paris. He painted a lot of such uh, portraits and uh, uh, because in ver he was trying to experiment how to give a good impression of color under very dark light circumstances. And uh, uh, there's one painting, I mean, he wrote, uh, he had a very uh, sustained correspondence with his brother, Theo van Gogh, who was living in, in Paris at that time. And those letters have all survived because Theo treasured them and kept them. Uh, in which he describes that, he says that he, there's one painting in which he feels that he really succeeded very well in what he was trying to do, and he was sending him the painting. And that letter has survived, but the painting has not. But given that this is a painting that's underneath a study that uh, 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 Van Gogh made while in Paris, people thought, well, this may well be it. And so they were particularly interested in, in this. But you see how little information they could see. They were not going to scrape off the top. I mean, one doesn't do that with uh, Van Gogh's paintings. Um, and then um, in... in uh, 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 something, oh, maybe now eight years ago or so, uh, uh, people, uh, uh, Joris Dick, who is uh, uh, somebody who has both art historian and chemical engineering degrees, realized that uh, a technique that uh, could be used, that, that can be used in order to do x-ray fluorescence, in order to analyze what materials are present deep in, 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 uh, in a sample, could maybe give more information about this painting. And so what's done there is that high energy x-rays are bombarded on, on, on a, sa a small sample and they uh, excite things to very high uh, uh, levels of energy from which things fall back into steps and the, 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 the fluorescence, so the, the, the frequency with which they fall back in the, s in, in the second step is something that is just determined by two bound uh, energy levels of the, of, the, of the atom and so, uh, or, or in the molecule in which it's living and so characterize the compound in which you're sitting, characterize the element and, and, and maybe more. And so that fluorescence can then be used to identify, I mean, depending on the, f on the, on the wavelength, you can see how much manganese or arsine or so on you have. And so they did that, actually, uh, they, they, this was the first painting that was done with this technology when people realized this could be done, uh, much smaller and portable ways of doing this were developed. But this first one, since this machinery didn't exist yet to analyze paintings, uh, um, they actually, it was done in a, a hospital in Amsterdam. Uh, they had uh, uh, gotten permission to use the beam of a very high energy x-ray source, which normally uh, was used in the hospital to make very short-lived radioactive elements, and which then were used for medical usage, of course. Uh, and so this beam is not in constant usage. And so when the beam was not used, they could have that beam in order to, to bombard pixel by pixel the, 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 I mean, and since it was done pixel-wise, there was no heating up that was going to damage the painting, and so uh, to examine that painting. And so they did that, and they got in different wavelengths. This is the one that they got in, uh, um, in, in, in molybdenum. This is the one in molybdenum, turns out to be an ingredient in Naples yellow 
which probably was the only uh, light color he was Van Gogh was using on his palette in these experiments. Uh, this was in uh, uh, mercury, which is a uh, 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 which which is one of the components in uh, uh, vermilion that Van Gogh was using, and this was in arsine. And here you see, I mean, if you know that there's this painting underneath, you see a little bit, but you see uh, much more of all the grass that's on top. And of course that's the problem, I mean the thing is giving you x-ray luminescence but it doesn't tell you I'm only looking at a certain depth, it can, it can use any of the atoms that it encounters somewhere and so it could be, so a lot of all the information in fact is very contaminated by the uh, surface painting. I mean even here where we see the lips standing out very much, we also see a lot of red standing out because there is red, uh, red blooms in the grass that Van Gogh was painting. And um, so, but this made a lot of, I mean, uh, made a lot of uh, publicity when it was first done. And uh, uh, actually, I have, I have later, yes, this picture is a picture that, I mean, at that around, if around 2005, 2006, if at that time, if you uh, 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 Googled Van Gogh woman portrait, this is the picture that you most found. I mean, it was uh, it made a, 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 a lot of, of, of uh, it got a lot of attention, and it was even the cover of a, a, a magazine of the Journal of Chemical Engineering. So, um, because people were so excited, what they had done in order to make this picture was they had used the Naples yellow and the red and so on to colorize this slightly, and. Uh, well, <laughs> with this, this interest that I, 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 I mean, the, 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 the uh, a little aside here, uh, how did I come to get to start working on art? I mean, image processing for art. Well, uh, Rick Johnson, who is a electrical engineering professor at uh, Cornell, uh, had spent uh, the year of 2007 in, uh, the, in, in, in Europe on sabbatical and he's always been very interested in art history and so he used the time to uh, get to know the curators at the Van Gogh Museum and uh, he, he uh, and, and the conservation department and he, no he said he noticed that they were using a lot of scientific tools. I mean, they were using uh, chemical analysis from little fragments. If fragments fell off, they were using x-rays and uh, uh, infrared photography. He said, but why don't you use any image analysis tools? He says, well, why would we? I mean, what would that do to us that we cannot just see with our microscopes and, and, and looking at it very carefully and studying these paintings? He says, well, I don't know, he says, because I'm not an image anal analyst, but maybe there are things that could be done. Would you like me to try to set up uh, a meeting of minds? And I said, sure. And so he actually uh, arranged for, uh, because by then they knew him and they trusted him, for teams to, uh, uh, to work on some of these data, if they could indeed uh, uh, get the data and sign for the fact that they were not going to release them to anybody. So I have data of these high resolution data of these Van Gogh paintings and I had to sign my soul away in case they ever leak. They haven't done so far but uh, uh, actually in the beginning the very first uh, I, I, this is this is something of the second project but the very first project we only were given uh, 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 grayscale images because even though we had signed our soul away they still took an additional measure of security. They figured that nobody was going to pay us a lot of money for black and white pictures of Van Gogh paintings and I think that's a, a reasonable assumption. Um, so, uh, but what happened, so these were, uh, we call them IP for AI uh, uh, workshops and they, they have now been held about once every 18 months or, or uh, two years. The next one will be this summer at the uh, 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 North Carolina Museum of Art in, in July. And uh, so, but the great thing about these, these, these workshops is that every time we present something, there are people who come up to us and they say, if you can do that, then maybe you can help me with this. And so the very first project, we were just trying to see whether we could detect whether something was an original or a copy painted after an original. And we can, and I can tell you more about that. But what happened is that Joris Dick walked up to us and he said, look, I can do this, but you guys know about image analysis. Can you do better given the raw data than this? And so that's what I'm going to tell you now about. So uh, the first thing that happened was that 
there are a lot of artifacts in this picture. Uh, and that was because of the acquisition. So this painting, I mean, so there's this x-ray beam. Of course, they were not going to reorient the x-ray beam. What happening was that the painting was mo sitting on a moving easel. And uh, it was scanned in, in, in typical zigzag. Now, since this, this x-ray beam was really used for something else, occasionally, I mean, more than half the time, it was diverted to something else. And then, of course, the whole thing had to stop and to resume moving only once the beam came back. Uh, and there was a synchronization problem. And there was no way this was a one shot. I mean, how often it already cost an arm and a leg to ensure this painting to go from the museum to the hospital for a good, uh, heaven's sake. I mean, uh, they were not going to get another chance to do this measurement. So uh, they had to live with the data. And if you, if you, I mean, for instance, here, if you uh, uh, enlarge this, then you see that, uh, that you have these kind of uh, zigzag artifacts because, well, there was a little, I mean, synchrony. And because of the zigzagging scan, you see that this, which should have been one blob is now uh, in a kind of zebra pattern. So the this is very visible, but the same thing happens all over. I mean, there's several breaks in every line. I mean, uh, and they said, well, these big things we kind of, I mean, uh, did this by hand in Photoshop, but there was just no way that we were going to do every little break like that. And, and uh, so the first thing we did is we wrote a variational algorithm and, and an iteration procedure in order to get rid of these things in order to, 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 I mean, and you have to do it since, since the thing is scanned sequentially, but the information, of course, is 2D. I mean, you, you have to, to do several uh, back and forths in the algorithm in order to get that, but we did that. And they were already very happy. I mean, that's, uh, and then uh, we said, but you know, we can do other things, which they hadn't expected we could do. Uh, because all these, where, where you have all these dark spots, is really because there, at the, the, the very thick impasto of the painting, of the top painting, there was a, a big flowering of the grass or so on, and the x-rays hadn't managed to penetrate, and so you have no information. So uh, we said, look, since this is all, all you see is because of brushwork of the uh, artist, we can, uh, just like you would think you can do uh, yourself a little bit, we can do the in-painting at every one of these blobs. We can just look elsewhere where things are very much like the surroundings and use that information. And so we used a, a, a Bayesian approach in order to do in-painting. We first painted uh, everything where we needed in-painting and then we used information elsewhere in order to do the in-painting and that got rid of all those little blobs. Then we said, look, there are also the, the things that come from uh, the, the, the grass stripes. We can again, that's a different in painting because now the information is not around but in, 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 in strips. So we can paint those and then in paint that. And then after that we were not happy with, with, with the eye here. And well, uh, so we, we, we told uh, uh, Joris Dick and he says, oh, he says, you just use the other eye. I mean, we do that all the time in, in <laughs> conservation. <laughs> and so that's what we did. And so here, the other eye, I mean, indeed. Uh, and uh, so in order to show, I mean, how really nicely and, and, and sensitively this is done, this is one of these, these things on her nose. And you see how nicely and, and the in-painting really is very nicely graded. And, and uh. Okay, so this was what they had. So we had to beat this. Uh, we had this uh, uh, molybdenum and we had the uh, mercury, uh, but we were missing all the earth colors. I mean, when you paint, you have all the earth colors. We also had no blue. So we realized that we really didn't have enough color information with the painting itself to get back to color. Uh, but we decided to go to the other paintings that Van Gogh had painted in this period and we picked out uh, uh, one that was extremely low in contrast and one that was extremely high in contrast. And we thought let's study what's happening here. And uh, we first uh, uh, morphed them so that, that the uh, shape of the faces would be more or less the same as, as the one we had. Um, and we then decompose them into luminance and chromance. 
which is very, which is typically what's done for color. And uh, of course, I mean here. What was the second word? Luminance and, and chromance. Uh, yes. So what 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 you do? I mean, so you have R, green, uh, red, green, and blue. And uh, if you have very little of any of them, even if it's three times as much blue, but very little as green or red, then you you see it as black. If you have a ton, then you see it as white. So. In, in, in uh, your color vision, you can really view as something that starts with uh, an, inv an, in, uh, an inverted cone and you have a color wheel and you can then look at more or less saturated and then when it becomes, when the, the at, as at the top you have again a cone that comes together. And so uh, if you, you now can think of luminance this from black to white. Chromance is where you sit on the color wheel. But if I do this for the very dark portrait, then you have to bear in mind that all this here is really completely useless information because I have no information there. I mean, it's telling me I'm there on the color wheel, but it's so dark that it's only where the luminance is reasonable that you can say something about the color wheel. So it's really only that information. Same for the other one. Here we have all that purple, but that's where it's extremely black. Again, that's not. So it was really only that. And then if you take into account some saturation, it turns out that even though these portraits looked so different, in chromance they were not so very different. So we could use the partial information we had on the yellow and the red, and information here, we could interpolate between these pictures. And so that's what we did. So this is the picture after we've done all our in-painting. And we are now going to uh, interpolate. And what we did again, bearing in mind the exp uh, experience of Massimo Fornasier, is to actually provide a gradation. And Joris Dick took this to a conference of uh, uh, art conservators and they voted. And so they looked at the different And, and they decided this was the one that seemed to them most. Uh, so what we did is use, I mean, uh, beautiful applications of, 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 of image analysis. I mean, first this ad hoc, this, this uh, special purpose uh, variational formalism, then in painting techniques of different types, and then later this color analysis in order to go from the thing on the left to the thing on the right. So we felt proud of that. I mean, uh, we, uh, we, it was, most of it was tools of the shelf and actually a lot of this work was done by undergraduates, uh, by an undergrad student for whom it was a senior thesis. But it was, uh, we call her lady 0.6 millimeters under. <laughs> but uh, the art historians don't like that very much. Uh, but, uh, okay, so that was the second of these topics. And we've had, we've done many more. In, I mean, when, when I showed this, uh, there was an art historian who works on uh, 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 early Renaissance paintings in Ghent who asked me, oh, he said, uh, we have things, I mean, actually it was more about discerning copies from originals. Uh, he said, I am working on uh, 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 Holsen van der Weyden, who is a, the grandson of a much more famous painting, Rogier van der Weyden, who, like anybody in the early 16th century, Holsen would make underdrawings on his uh, panels before he would paint uh, his, his top painting. And uh, they had seen different styles in his underdrawings. Some of them were very detailed and some of them were kind of sketchy and some of them were just like some eyes here and some curls there and a chin there. And, and I mean, really a shorthand more than a sketch even. And it, the natural hypothesis was, well, he just, as he became more mature, he needed less of this f preliminary drawing before he knew what he was going to paint. But then they found the same style within the same painting. I mean, so, which surely was painted within a period of a couple of months. So, and then uh, he said, well, maybe, as was customary, and Hulsen van der Weyden actually had many, maybe he had apprentices in his workshop who did some of the work. And maybe the ones where there's a lot of detail are things where the apprentice was going to do it and where there was not a lot, something what he was going to finish. 
and uh, this seemed a reasonable hypothesis but then he said that must mean since you can distinguish different hands in a painting can you see whether you can correlate different styles in the underdrawing with different styles in the top painting and and we could and I can show you more about that but that's not in this talk so, but every time new projects come up, I mean, now that we're talking, now that I'm at Duke, I'm talking with people in the North Carolina Museum of Art, and we're looking at a fantastic altarpiece by Giotto. And uh, so looking at possible different hands in that painting. And uh, it's, uh, it's so much fun to do uh, image processing on, on art. I mean, if you're interested if, if, if in, uh, in image processing, I, I suggest you look at it. It's much easier to get students enthusiastic about looking at a Van Gogh or Giotto than at looking at, at uh, cameraman again and let's not even talk about Lena I mean uh, uh, okay a third project this is actually a, uh, a project uh, that uh, Rick Johnson did himself so uh, and this again grew out of the uh, image processing for art investigation uh, 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 workshops so um, one thing that uh, 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 art uh, uh, conservators and, and do or uh, curators do when they make what they call a catalogue raisonné, which means a catalogue in which they put everything they can possibly think of about a piece of art or every piece of art that's in the catalogue, is they uh, do what's called thread counts in order to characterize the canvas. And they typically do that not, I mean, you might think, well, I just turn it over and I take a photograph and that's it. But many, and in fact, almost all of Van Gogh's paintings are paintings that have been uh, 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 stabilized by uh, different campaigns of art conservation, conservation and you cannot access the back canvas because at some point uh, art conservators uh, uh, glued on or in some case ironed on uh, 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 a much sturdier piece of canvas because as I said Van Gogh was poor he, he would paint on anything he could find and so some of the canvas on which he, he painted is, is canvas that starts deteriorating under the action of the chemicals in the paints and in order to keep the thing stable they reinforce the back canvas but so the result is that you don't see the original canvas anymore and so uh, uh, the uh, then the way to get actually a thread count is that you see that very well in the x-rays because canvas is primed in order to paint on it and priming means that it is uh, 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 coated with a layer of in that time certainly lead white and glue and uh, it's still, you still see some canvas after that, but it's much flatter than it was originally and it also will absorb paint in a very different way than if it weren't coated. And, uh, but since the canvas has these valleys and mountains, this, uh, 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 this primer will be in a thicker layer in every valley than on every one of the mountains. And so since lead white, lead absorbs x-rays very well, if you take an x-ray painting of it, then you start seeing the canvas. I mean, like here. This is an x-ray, you see again the nails. That, that's a telling thing that tells you it's an x-ray. And you see the weft and, 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 and the weave of the, of, the, of, the, of the canvas. And that's how people see the canvas. They actually see a kind of negative of the canvas, since they see the valleys thick, I mean in white, and the, 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 the mountains in, in, in little bit. Uh, so what, what, what art uh, for catalogue raisonné, what people would do is they would uh, look at it as a microscope and they would put a little a centimeter next to it and they would count. And uh, I mean, this is some, one of those tasks that uh, 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 art conservators put off till the very last. I mean, when, 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 and, and they don't do too many because they get a headache and I mean, it's, I mean, it's really not very inspiring, I mean, uh, as a job to do. But so, uh, when Rick Johnson heard this, he said, come on, I mean, that is something that must be automatic. You should be able to do that automatically. And, uh, and indeed, I mean, they did. It's not as easy as you think, because, of course, I mean, it would be easy if this was just a nice rectangular grid. But of course it isn't. I mean, and it's not evenly spaced. I mean, you might think, oh, it's easy for you to transform. Well, I mean, it's not completely evenly spaced. I mean, also the, the, the canvas undulates. 
I mean, the angle is not always straight and so on. But I mean, you can work on it. You do local Fourier transforms, you, you uh, windowed Fourier transforms. And uh, so you see here the canvas and it's negative uh, so that you can see it nicely. And <laughs> yeah, here is a canvas where you very clearly see the, the, the undulating of the weave. Uh, so what, what he did with I mean uh, with with a whole class of undergraduates is they made a little software and they and so on in order to do the little uh, uh, the, the the Fourier analysis locally and they then uh, again the, the, the in all these things uh, one of the problems is how are you going to interface with the art historians and so they hit on the fact that they were going to use a color coding to show the deviation from the horizontal or from the vertical. In this case it's the deviation I think from the vertical. And they showed color coding and all of a sudden it was clear that the non-uniformity of the, of the weave came out very nicely in this representation. And I mean they looked at it uh, uh, horizontally and vertically but then there were paintings that were clearly matched in these two paintings, which actually were painted within a week of each other. I mean, it was known, I mean, Van Gogh had taken notes, clearly are from the same piece of fabric. I mean, you just see the pattern. Coin I mean, this, this irregularity in the weave coincide, uh, uh, continue from one to the next. And the, these paintings, you start looking at them, I mean, look how the patterns continue. And not only that, but then you can look at the pattern in the other direction. I mean, and so as a result, it became possible for things, I mean, again, because Van Gogh was poor, he would buy his canvas in big pieces and then cut it and put it on frames. In fact, in this period, uh, there was also some, I believe it's this period, there were also some paintings made by Gauguin from the same roll of canvas. And so they can actually see where they fit in, in, in that piece of canvas. So this is something that art historians are, are lapping up. I mean, uh, because it may gives them a possibility of, of, of dating, of grouping together paintings from similar periods. and. Okay, well, I didn't have it here. Uh, actually, I don't have it here because I don't have permission to show it because the thing hasn't been published yet. But what has happened is that uh, the, uh, um, there are paintings that uh, were, about people were in doubt whether they were <laughs> original or not. And uh, because this, it was, well, one of his off days, I mean, it wasn't as nice as some of the others. And, and uh, But it clearly fits with, with the fabric. I mean, it's a piece of fabric between two paintings of which they are absolutely sure that he did describe in letters and so on. And this one that about which he was less proud because it's not that <coughs> good was clearly from the same roll of fabric. I mean, so the likelihood that it's an authentic painting is now much higher all of a sudden. The insurance has gone up. I mean, uh, <laughs> but this is now, now now people are looking at it for paintings of, of very different painters. I mean, there is at least one painting in in uh, uh, in in, in uh, the Tate that uh, the uh, uh, that that the conservators were thinking was not original, and that they will have to revise their opinion of. There are other situations in which people wondered which of uh, several versions was painted earlier and which was painted later, and this canvas kind of cutting has sh made it possible to date some of the paintings earlier and some of them later. And uh, so again, so and that's really, I mean, that really fits in in, in Fourier talks, doesn't it? I mean, it's really the windowed Fourier uh, transform. And uh, so that was it for this talk. And uh, I'm I'm happy to take questions. And I can I can uh, uh, show more stuff on on IP4AI. I could go on for a much longer time, but I haven't prepared it here. So. Oh, I mean, uh, sorry. I was checking like, uh, so can you do the repainting 
stuff? Yes. What is the error metric? You what's the error metric? Okay, what's the error metric we use for in painting? Um, well, that has been gauged on, on other things. Here we don't have ground truth, but people who develop these in painting algorithms have tested them on things where they had ground truth. And they typically, like everybody in image analysis, use an, an L2. Uh, uh, way of, of gauging, although that everybody also agrees that that's not the best one, but it's by far the most convenient. So, uh, but these things have been gauged. I mean, and we we are working at. Uh, I mean, we didn't try to go at extremely high resolution. We didn't have the information at extremely high resolution. So, at the resolution where we were working, it was not uh, not a crucial problem. Well, since this is a mathematics colloquium, yes, and you touched once or twice. Uh, so for those who are ignorant like me, what are the principal mathematical tools that we should think about that you used here? Okay, so the principal ma so the question was, uh, what are the principal mathematical tools? Surely that is an appropriate question in a mathematics colloquium. Uh, 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 the, uh, so we, we typically, we, we, we try to always decompose the information, the partial information we have into, uh, uh, into a basis or into uh, uh, a set of, of, of dictionary functions in which we know that the information will be very well represented so, so that we have sparse representation. That is used both in the in-painting and, and, and in some of the other uh, uh, applications. So the idea is the partial uh, information gives you enough to identify coefficients with respect to that sparse uh, representation and then you can use the fact that you know it will have a sparse representation to continue. So uh, in order to get there you use uh, 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 tools from variational uh, uh, analysis and, uh, uh, and yeah the different uh, sparse representation tools that have been developed over the last decade or so. Uh, uh, we use very often we use wavelets to decompose the images because wavelets are, are, are a good, a good way of distinguishing, of, of decomposing images, uh, but I expect that for other applications we, 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 we might very well use other tools. And uh, so it's mostly uh, Fourier analysis, uh, wavelet analysis and uh, uh, functional analysis tools and variational techniques. So to cover my ignorance then, so what's the criterion of a sparse representation? Okay, so the idea is that you uh, you you you're given if if you're given a noisy version so uh, and and uh, some operation operator working on on a noisy version of of the uh, so so the idea is that you 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 try to recover an f the measurement of it is some linear operator acting on that f and you know noise has been added to it and this is your measurement and what you want to do is to, to find the f back. And so then we typically try to look at, uh, uh, we try to find a minimum, the, 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 the g that will minimize this. But uh, we know that uh, noise is, of course, I mean, that's why we don't try to invert. I mean, typically the thing cannot be inverted. But then we also know that f is with respect to some uh, uh, family of functions which for images often wavelets will have an expansion that is uh, that has much fewer so we have an index set here in which the lambda scans it but the uh, 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 the ones that are really used in order to give a very accurate representation for f so this is typically very small for uh, uh, cardinality of lambda f that is much much smaller than the cardinality of the whole index set. Now the thing is that which elements sit in lambda f is very dependent on f. It's not the first few of an orthogonal uh, polynomial and so on. It can be any of them but it's a small number and that is then captured by uh, saying that we want to make a balance between sparsity and uh, 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 and and uh, uh, the the and 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 the the the, the uh, what's this called again? 
the air term or the residual the residu well the residual or or, or uh, we 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 do that by saying that if g is is going to be given by so let's call it g here and then we have a cg we then will put a an an, an, an l1 bound for instance on these coefficients c and we try to minimize that so we have here that b is uh, uh, we do it minimizer over g equals the sum over lambda in some sparse lambda g smaller than some n of c lambda psi lambda um, and uh, and if we have additional information we will use that in in there as well thank you very much it's yeah very you're welcome I have one more question. It, it seems that so part of the, the in painting would resolve a problem that I think sometimes is referred to as occlusion. And I'm wondering, I mean, one of the naive things that I don't know I would have tried maybe first would be to correlate the, the, the surface picture with its x ray signature and then just to subtract. Did they do that or did that? Uh, it, 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 it doesn't. Uh, uh, in fact, what we did in order to 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 uh, to get the, the final version was we we did we did that, but in a slightly uh, more sophisticated form. We said we have the surface picture that gives us a, 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 a prior on where we expect a, a structure to be not from the image, and so we discount that more. But so we did that. In, but but if we just try subtracting, it didn't work. Let's take this, you guys.